Now, it is likely that the Queen's personal face will be reflected in an address from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Whilst many of the hymns were chosen with Her Majesty's understanding, here with me to discuss the faith of Her Majesty and the King's role as defender of the faith is historian and columnist Martin Whit Whitlock. Uh, Martin, <clears throat> now, of course, there's quite a lot of historical context to this. Cause we had the dissolution of the monasteries and so on and so forth. Can you give us a sort of background as to how um, the, the sort of monarchy became the head of the Church of England? Well, to cut a very long story short, uh, basically uh, in the 1530s, Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church. Uh, he effectively nationalised the church in England and made himself supreme governor of the Church of England, a role that would have been held before the Pope, uh, before that by the Pope, um, and defender of the faith. Interestingly, defender of the faith was a, was a a uh, accolade had been given him by the previous Pope for defending Catholicism, but that continued into the new role. And basically ever since then, monarchs of England and then of course of the United Kingdom have carried that role of defender of the faith. But interestingly enough, in England, the monarch is supreme governor of the Church of England, but they are not supreme governor of the Church of Scotland, which does not recognise the monarch as its head. So a quite extraordinary situation there. But basically, they are there to be representatives of the Christian faith in this country to head it, but not in Scotland, interestingly enough, where they are an ordinary congregant, an ordinary member of the congregation. Quite extraordinary, that thought, isn't it? But ever since the 16th century, that has been the official role of the monarchs of England and then of the United Kingdom. The eighth, uh, he, and he, he was actually, because he was married to, um, wasn't it, um, what was her name? Not Catherine of Aragon. It was Catherine of Aragon, actually, yeah. he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. Yeah. And the Pope refused to annul, to, to sort of refuse to allow him to have the uh, marriage annulled. So then, of course, the, the king said, right, well, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get rid of you and I'm going to make the rules and get rid of the, the Church of England and dis dissolve all the monasteries and take charge of it myself. But uh, can I ask about, in terms of, in terms of the, the Queen then, because obviously um, this was, she was obviously a real passion for her faith. How did the, her faith um, play a role in her life and, and service? That's a really good question, because, as you say, the roots of this go back to the 16th century. You know, it is a, an official constitutional title. But for Queen Elizabeth II, it was a personal commitment. It was not simply a constitutional title, important as that is. Back in 2022, sorry, back, beg your pardon, back in 2002, so quite a long time ago now, she said, I know just how much I rely on my faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. In her Christmas address in 2014, she said, for me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life. It really mattered to her. And in her later years, she increasingly spoke of her religious faith and devotion, citing her personal accountability before God in one of her Christmas messages. And perhaps in some ways, most poignantly, her Christmas address in 2021, so her last Christmas address, said, it's the simplicity of the Christmas story that makes it so universally appealing, simple happenings that form the starting point of the life of Jesus, a man whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation and have been the bedrock of my faith. His birth marks a new beginning. As the carol says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And I think that's so appropriate because at this time of transition and change, there will be hopes, there will be fears. But she clearly said that for her, in situations of change, of hope and fear, it was rooted in her faith in Jesus. And that was transformative for her as an individual person, as Elizabeth the woman, in addition to being Elizabeth the queen. So it's quite extraordinary, really. And in addition to that, she made it quite clear that though she was constitutionally head of the Church of England, she saw herself as being a defender and a protector of, of, of faith across the board. And, and in 2012, at the Lambeth, uh, Lambeth Palace, there was an ecumenical meeting of people from a whole range of faiths. And she, she paid tribute to the particular mission of Christianity. But she also paid tribute to the general value of faith in this country. And that means that people of all faiths, uh, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, could, could look to this person who had a personal religious faith herself and recognise that she recognised the value of their faiths, although she sub subscribed particularly and personally to the Christian faith herself. An extraordinary woman, but also an extraordinary monarch who could reach out to people across cultural divisions. Mm. 
And, and of course, the, the whole Commonwealth, everything to do with that. She's a very educated woman, and she showed that uh, uh, she was compassionate to all different uh, creeds, colours, races, and different faiths. Um, I'm wondering, the, the order of service tomorrow, what, what's the plan then for tomorrow's service? Well, obviously, in, in a plan of this of, of service of this type, which is obviously very grand, it, it, it's a state funeral, uh, but in many ways it also contains very, very simple and profound elements within the grandeur, within the pomp and circumstance, within the, the gold uh, and, and, and the scarlet, which is basically giving thanks for the life of a human being. This is common to the Anglican liturgy at funerals, recognising the hope of resurrection, which is central to the Christian faith and will be rooted in the Anglican funeral liturgy, and committing the person, in this case, uh, the former queen, to the love and mercy of God, in sure and certain hope of her resurrection. And it was interesting that on the evening that she died, in many ways, the Archbishop of Canterbury summed up this faith when she said, he said, may she rest in peace and rise in glory. And although a lot else will happen in that service tomorrow, in many ways, that is the core of what will be declared. May she rest in peace, her current state, but may she rise in glory because she believed in the resurrection from the dead, which one day she would experience as a believer in Jesus Christ. So at, at its simplest, that is what will happen tomorrow within all the grandeur, within all the pop, with, within all the, the amazingness of, of, of a straight funeral. That simple statement of faith will be the drumbeat that will be the central core of it. Well, Martin, listen, it's really good to talk to you. That's Martin Whittock. He's a historian and a columnist.